It's my pleasure to introduce today's seminar speaker, Dr. Michael Zakovich. Dr. Michael Zakovich received his bachelor's in horticulture science at Purdue University in 2013, working at the laboratory of Dr. Kerry Mitchell. He stayed an additional two years and completed his master's at Dr. Mitchell's lab, focusing on the effects of wavelengths of light on the sensory and chemical properties of greenhouse tomatoes. Dr. Michael then conducted his dissertation research as a USDA National Needs Fellow, working in the laboratories of Dr. Dr. David Francis and Dr. Jessica Cooperstone at The Ohio State University. His dissertation research mainly focused on exploring natural diversity in tomato secondary metabolism to define how tomato consumption affected human health. Michael then conducted a brief postdoc at NC State, determining how both natural and engineered genetic variation affects the efficiency by which pro-vitamin A carotenoids are absorbed in the small intestine. He is now a research plant physiologist uh, with the USDA located at Children's Nutrition Research Center in Houston. And his laboratory seeks to continue working at the interface of plant physiology, genetics, analytical chemistry, and human health. With that, I'll hand it over to Dr. Michael, and we are uh, excited to hear what you have for us. Thank you. Thanks so much for that introduction, Kishan. And um, yeah, like you mentioned, I'm uh, working here at the USDA ARS, and specifically, I'm located at the Children's Nutrition Research Center. And I just started in September. Uh, so I'm just getting my lab set up at the moment, but I wanted to present some of the research that I've done um, in the recent past uh, as I'm, I'm planning on kind of drawing from some of these skill sets and experiences uh, moving forward. Uh, so like he mentioned, I uh, did my BS and my MS with Dr. Kerry Mitchell at Purdue University, uh, looking at how different wavelengths of light affect uh, the nutritional and sensory properties of greenhouse tomatoes. I then moved over to the Ohio State University and worked with Dr. David Francis and Dr. Jessica Cooperstone, who's a, uh, who are plant breeders and geneticists and uh, analytical chemists and nutrition scientists, respectively. Um, and there I was kind of looking more broadly at how genetics influences tomatoes and how, how that bio changes in biochemistry uh, might affect human health. And that's some of the research that I'm going to be presenting on today. I took a, uh, a little stint away from tomatoes um, after about yeah, nine years of tomato research, I switched over to sorghum, um, doing more kind of fundamental work uh, in a nutrition lab run by Dr. Mario Ferruzzi, uh, looking at how pro-vitamin A carotenoids and, and uh, mineral elements are released in the gut and absorbed. And then now I'm, I'm here at the CNRC working with the ARS, um, but I'm also, uh, I also have a joint appointment with the Baylor College of Medicine. So it's a little bit of a unique position in that I have to um, follow some of the rules through the university and follow some of the ARS rules. And um, I have basically two bosses to report to and to make matters worse, uh, we had a clerical issue in the uh, identification card system. And so my role of plant physiologist was accidentally changed to plant psychologist. And so if any of you are working with plant stress physiology, I want to let you know that my door is always open uh, to hear the needs of your plants and see if we can uh, talk some things out. All right, I wanted to uh, start off by kind of taking a 30,000 foot view here of uh, the projects I'm gonna be discussing today. And so one of the first uh, objectives of this research is to determine how tomato consumption affects biological processes using a mouse model. Uh, the next has to do with uh, development of methods uh, to quantify phytochemicals that previously didn't really have methods available for them. And the third is to kind of tie this all together and to understand how genetic variation affects phytochemical profiles within the red fruited clade. All right, kind of keeping it the, the 30,000 foot view, why are we interested in tomatoes in the first place? Uh, so this is the most produced fruit in the world, and Americans consume on average close to 40 pounds of them a, a year, most of which in a processed form. And they're very popular for, for, their, their, culinary, for, uh, for their culinary properties, uh, but they also produce an array of different phytochemicals that have been associated with a number of health benefits. And probably the most famous one is the red colored pigment lycopene. And most of the research with lycopene started back in the mid 90s from a large epidemiological study that was conducted. And essentially close to 50,000 healthcare professionals uh, had their dietary patterns tracked uh, and their uh, kind of disease outcomes tracked over time. And what they essentially found after kind of cranking through all these data 
was that for some reason, uh, tomatoes and tomato containing products were associated with a decreased risk in the development of prostate cancer. And the, the decrease in risk was akin to like 30%. Uh, which is, I, I really want to stress how big of a finding that is, um, because it's kind of on par with like a, a pharmaceutical drug or a chemo preventative drug. And again, this is just regular consumption of a vegetable. And so what the authors of the study did was they essentially looked at the uh, carotenoid profiles of their uh, subjects, and they basically concluded that lycopene seems to be the unique carotenoid found in tomatoes. Um, about 80% of the uh, the lycopene that we get from our diet comes from tomatoes. And so they kind of took this reductionist approach and uh, kind of figured that lycopene was the causative agent of this reduction in disease uh, risk. Uh, but there could be other compounds that are, that are playing a role here. And so this has been tested in other studies as well. And so what I'm showing here is a, a study that was conducted about 20 years ago. And so what you're seeing here is a survival curve. And so uh, a population of rats that were destined to develop prostate cancer were given a few different types of diets. One was a control diet. One was a control diet plus lycopene powder. And the other was a control diet plus tomato powder. And what you can see from this figure is that uh, lycopene did have some positive influence, uh, but for some reason, whole tomato powder seems to have an edge. There's something else in whole tomatoes besides lycopene that seems to be having a benefit. And so a natural uh, next question is, okay, maybe it's a, is it a dosage kind of thing? You know, what if we consume more lycopene? Is there more of a clinical outcome from that? And so a, a more recent study that came out of Ohio State from a few years ago from the lab that I did my PhD in, utilized natural variation in the uh, carotenoid profiles of tomato and, and utilized a type of tomato called tangerine. And so these essentially have a mutation in the carotenoid biosynthesis pathway that forces them to accumulate cis-lycopene isomers, uh, which are more bioavailable compared to the all trans form found in red tomatoes. And what I'm showing you here is uh, a figure where uh, mice were fed diets containing either red or tangerine tomatoes. And what you can see is that there's almost twice as much lycopene in the skin of these animals uh, from those that consume the diets containing tangerine tomatoes than the ones that consume the red tomatoes. So clearly more bioavailability there and a nice opportunity to test this nutritional question. And so in this study, uh, a skin cancer model was used. And what you can see here is uh, a a time series of mice that were fed either a control diet, control diet plus tangerine tomato powder, or a control diet plus red tomato powder. And if you look at the end of the study, uh, what you can see is that there really isn't a big difference between the animals that were fed diets containing tangerine tomatoes versus red tomatoes, uh, but the controls were about twice as high. And, and uh, to point out, this is measuring tumor number. And so what you're seeing is about a 50% reduction in tumor number just from eating tomatoes in general. And so this kind of tells us, okay, maybe there's, there's something else about tomatoes that's uh, driving uh, this, this change in, in disease outcomes that we're seeing. And so I think this is a really nice place to kind of introduce the concept of metabolomics. Um, many of you have probably heard this term before, but uh, I think it's often misunderstood. But I think probably the best way to think about it is that it's, it's just part of, of the kind of dogma that we think of in terms of going from a, a genome to transcribed genes to proteins and then to the chemicals that are eventually made by those proteins. And there's also other uh, ohms as well. Um, I think nowadays you can um, think about just about every phenotype uh, that you can imagine and assign an ohm to it. Um, but I'm going to be focusing mostly on the, the metabolome in this talk. And so this is basically a collection of small molecular weight molecules. Uh, so everything from amino acids, sugars, lipids, primary and secondary metabolites. And what's important to keep in mind is that the metabolome is uh, often on the move, uh, partly because it's it's influenced by genetics, but it can also be highly influenced by the environment. And so this is something to really keep in mind uh, with metabolomics experiments in general, um, in terms of uh, how you set up your experimental design and how you analyze your data. Okay, so I introduced metabolomics and I've, I've talked about how uh, we're interested in, in tomatoes in general, because there seems to be this disease preventative property to it. 
Um, but before we, you know, kind of answer that question in terms of what is it that's that's causing this uh, effect, um, there's kind of a, a, a baseline question that needed to be answered first. And that's basically what compounds are we actually absorbing when we eat tomatoes? And so I, I mentioned in this question here, the liver specifically, uh, and I mentioned the liver because this is the primary metabolizing organ in mammals. This is kind of the first, uh, one of the first main stops where chemicals from our food uh, get deposited, get metabolized, and then distributed to the rest of the body. And so what we see in the liver uh, can often be kind of a window into what might be happening in the rest of the body. All right, so the first part of my talk here is actually gonna be an animal study, um, which hopefully is a, a little bit of a change from uh, the normal uh, plant-only talks that, that we probably see here in the seminar series. Uh, but essentially, this was a really, uh, really great project that I had the opportunity to uh, design and work on as part of my National Needs Fellowship during my PhD. And so I essentially was able to collaborate with people working in food science and working in uh, cancer oncology to try to answer this question of what happens when you eat a tomato. All right, so the, the status quo of, of this question, it, it's not that it hasn't been uh, answered in some ways before, uh, but there are still some gaps in the literature in terms of uh, how this question has been addressed in the past. One of the main things that I've seen is that in the past, people have used mouse models or animal models that have mutations in the genome that can have pleiotropic effects and affect many other processes. So a great example of that is using uh, BCO1 or BCO2 knockout mice uh, which essentially is, is uh, targeted towards uh, an enzyme that cleaves beta carotene, um, but it also has major effects in other processes like lipid metabolism. Uh, so studies done with this type of model uh, might be a little bit tricky to interpret in terms of um, what might happen to people. From a gene expression standpoint, uh, most of the studies have used targeted approaches like qPCR, uh, so you're very biased in terms of what genes you might be able to see uh, and quantify as a response to diet. And from an analytical side, it's using, uh, most of the studies out there have used targeted approaches. And so you're just seeing the chemicals that you're uh, creating methods for to uh, measure specifically. So you won't really get the full picture of what might be going on. And so the approach that we took was, uh, um, we were using an animal model for this for this study specifically, uh, but we were using wild type mice. And so again, this is maybe a little bit of a, a, a different approach in that we might not have some of the same pleiotropic effects from the specific mutations that have been used in other studies. For gene expression, we used RNA seq, and again, this was this was to get a more global picture of what might be happening as a response to uh, dietary intervention. And then from an analytical standpoint, we use untargeted metabolomics as a way to get a, a broad picture of what was happening with the, within the chemical landscape of liver tissue uh, in response to tomato feeding. And so I have an outline of the experimental design here. We had uh, groups of 12 mice that were fed either a, a control diet, which is AIN-93G, uh, which is a, a standard purified diet used for mouse studies. Then we had that same, another group that had that same diet, but it was supplemented with 10% uh, tangerine tomato powder and another group that had the control diet plus uh, red tomato powder. After 10 weeks, the mice were sacrificed and the livers were harvested for RNA-seq analysis and untargeted metabolomics. So I'll start with the untargeted metabolomics story. Um, we were specifically interested in uh, a polar extract uh, from these livers. And part of that has to do with the fact that um, in terms of using untargeted metabolomics, we, we kind of came into this um, knowing that based on the tomatoes that we were selecting, we expected to see fat soluble compounds like carotenoids to be different. And so we wanted to look at the polar side of things because that's a little bit harder to predict in terms of what the outcomes might be. Uh, specifically, these data are from using electrospray ionization in positive mode. Um, generally speaking, you get more, uh, more compounds tend to ionize that way than in negative mode, so we could capture more uh, uh, chemical variation that way. Uh, and then we use uh, uh, Agilent's ProFinder, uh, which is their software for basically um, deconvoluting all the peaks and kind of normalizing everything. Uh, and then all the data were analyzed in R. 
So to give you guys kind of a sense of, of what an untargeted metabolomics workflow might look like, uh, I wanted to kind of walk you through, uh, you know, kind of what the data looked like, um, basically from the instrument to the time of being able to analyze them. And so looking at the raw data, we started with uh, over 9,000 chemical features. So obviously that's quite a bit to work with, uh, quite a bit to understand, and um, pretty difficult to interpret. And so we used a pre-processing step to basically eliminate chemical features that might not have been um, true chemical features or may have been adducts or, or just otherwise noise. Uh, from there, I used a battery of uh, univariate and multivariate statistics uh, as a way to kind of generate a, a parsimonious list of chemical features that we should prioritize for identification. And one thing I want to point out here is that with untargeted metabolomics, you don't necessarily know what the compounds are because you're basically just getting a, a mass and a retention time. Um, so limiting the amount of compounds that you have for identification is, is pretty critical uh, unless you have a, a very built up uh, library of compounds to start with. Okay, the first thing that I wanted to show you is a scores plot from a principal components analysis. And the first thing I wanted to point out about this PCA uh, is that you can see there are these uh, blue triangles here that are clustering closely together. These are our quality control samples. And so the fact that they're clustering close together indicates that we didn't really have any uh, batch effects or anything that was happening that would indicate that there was something going on with the instrument itself. Uh, in terms of the actual separation of the data, uh, the green squares here are, are the uh, livers from control-fed mice, uh, and then the red and yellow uh, circles and diamonds represent liver samples from the tomato-fed animals. And so you can see there's a very clear separation between those two groups. Uh, but there's also kind of less separation between uh, the individual tomato types, uh, which kind of makes sense because uh, tomato to tomato, they're probably quite chemically similar. So that makes a lot of sense, uh, biologically speaking. So because we didn't see a lot of differences between the two tomato types, uh, that gave us some evidence that we could use to kind of uh, pool those uh, groups together and essentially uh, compare tomato fed versus control fed. And what I'm showing you here is a volcano plot. And essentially, this is uh, plotting uh, full change in intensity of a chemical feature versus a uh, negative log 10 adjusted p-value. And we found 161 chemical features that were different between our tomato-fed and our control-fed animals. And what you can see is that most of them are on the right side here, which is uh, greater than uh, Great, it's basically a positive change. And so essentially we hypothesize that, the, hypothesize that these are the chemical features that are being derived directly from tomato consumption. Okay, the next figure I wanted to show you guys is a heat map. And so this heat map was constructed using features that were generated from uh, multivariate statistics. I think in this case, this was from PLSDA. And so essentially all of these chemical features had a variable importance score greater than one, which is the uh, standard threshold uh, for what we consider to be important. And what I wanna point out here is that in this heat map, there's this large swath of chemical features where you can clearly see uh, they're absent in the controls and present in both of our tomato fed groups. And again, the fundamental question that was driving this project is, what happens when you eat a tomato, what chemicals are deposited in the liver uh, from tomato consumption. And so I also mentioned that identifying these compounds is, is kind of a, an onerous task. And so this seems like the best place to start uh, because this is truly where we're seeing uh, this presence absence relationship between these chemical features uh, as a function of diet. And so after, uh, quite a lot of work, uh, we determined that these chemical features belong to uh, phase one and phase two metabolites of steroidal glycoalkaloids. And so these are compounds that are uniquely made by tomatoes. And uh, previously, up until maybe a couple of years ago, it was assumed that these compounds weren't even absorbed, uh, let alone metabolized by the liver. 
We were also able to confirm a couple of them by authentic standard, uh, but the rest we had to use uh, fragmentation experiments on our high resolution mass spectrometer to essentially rationalize what these compounds were. And so what I'm showing you here is a, a figure of, of one such compound where essentially we have the, the parent compound here, and I was able to kind of go through each of these uh, chemical features and look at the fragmentation patterns and try to deduce what each of these uh, fragments were. And, and what we can see is that these compounds uh, fragment in a predictable way. Uh, so that helped us identify, or at least tentatively identify these as phase one and phase two metabolites. And so if you're not familiar with uh, phase one and phase two metabolism, uh, very briefly, this is a uh, kind of biochemical processing uh, that occurs within the small intestine as well as the liver. And essentially in phase one, these are uh, very simple reactions that are carried out by cytochrome P450s. So these involve uh, desaturations or hydroxylations. And in phase two metabolism, uh, it's a little bit more complicated uh, in which mo chemical moieties are, are basically tacked on to the compound that's being metabolized. Uh, and all of this is with the objective of making them more water soluble so that we can excrete them uh, in the urine. And even though this is kind of considered a detoxification process, it doesn't necessarily mean that the compound that's being acted on is, is bad. Uh, this can happen with uh, vitamins and, and other compounds that are critical for our health. Okay, so that was the untargeted metabolomics portion of it. And now I wanna introduce what happened with the RNA-seq data that we collected on the same tissue. Okay, for our RNA-seq, uh, we used 100 base pair paradigm reads. Uh, we sequenced it pretty deeply at 40 to 50 million reads per sample, and we use an EDGE-R pipeline uh, in R to analyze the data. And so here, this is kind of the uh, workflow for RNA-seq. It's a little bit different than on targeted metabolomics uh, in that the main difference is that you're aligning, it to a, you're aligning your reads to a reference genome. Uh, with untargeted metabolomics, you don't really have a, a reference metabolome per se. So in this case, we're actually able to kind of uh, put the pieces of the puzzle back together um, because we can kind of see the, uh, the lid of the box if, if you want to use that analogy. Uh, and then at the end of this, uh, we had a number of different comparisons that we were using uh, in terms of our different treatments, uh, including just kind of tomato versus control. And the first figure that I wanted to show you here is uh, from multidimensional scaling. Uh, this is another way of, of kind of uh, lowering the dimensionality of our data so that we can better see the spread of what was happening. And when I first generated this figure, I was kind of kind of bummed out a little bit because with the untargeted metabolomics data, there was a very clear separation uh, with our with our treatments. However, in this case, it's it's kind of all mixed together. And I thought about it more and more, and I realized that we're actually asking a uh, kind of a subtle biological question, which is what happens when you eat a tomato? And so I think it's it's reasonable to say that the genome shouldn't be changing or the transcriptome shouldn't be changing a lot as a function of eating a vegetable. Um, so I think in a lot of ways, seeing seeing this outcome is, is a good thing. Now, that being said, it, it doesn't mean that nothing changed. We actually had, depending on the uh, comparison that you looked at, uh, we actually had anywhere from a handful to a few hundred genes differentially expressed as a, as a function of diet. And what I'm showing you here is a Venn, Venn diagram of upregulated genes and a Venn diagram of downregulated genes. And so to help make sense of all this, I use gene set enrichment analysis to try to group the differentially expressed genes into uh, biological processes. And one that I'm highlighting here uh, that occurred or it had hits in all of our comparisons is this uh, drug metabolism by cytochrome P450. Uh, if you remember back a couple of slides, I mentioned that the cytochrome P450s are involved in phase one metabolism. And you can see other categories of biological processes um, that are all kind of related to phase one and phase two metabolism. Uh, and so these two data sets uh, with the RNA-seq and the untargeted metabolomics data really kind of support each other. Um, ultimately, we're seeing changes in gene expression in genes that are related to enzymes that produce the chemical features that we saw uh, that differentiated tomato versus non-tomato fed animals.
All right, to kind of wrap up this part, uh, we had 161 chemical features that were significantly different between mice-fed control diets and mice-fed tomato-containing diets. Steroidal alkaloids comprised um, the most distinguishing features that we saw between our control and tomato-fed uh, mice. 19 of these masses corresponded to steroidal alkaloid metabolites that we identified at levels one and two. And uh, lastly, tomato consumption modestly affected gene expression, um, but the differences that we observed were mostly uh, relegated to phase one and phase two metabolism. So again, uh, these two data sets fit really nicely together. All right, so I showed this figure earlier in that uh, trying to make the point that, you know, we think lycopene probably does something. It has, a, has bioactivity, certainly is a, a potent antioxidant, um, but there's something about whole tomato powder that, that seems to have this edge. And so we, we discovered these steroidal alkaloid metabolites in the liver tissue, uh, which corroborates previous findings of uh, a couple of these metabolites that have been found in the skin, as well as the blood of mice that have consumed tomatoes. Um, so that's really given us a lot of reason to pursue these compounds a little bit more to better understand their role in our health. All right, so what are tomato steroidal glycoalkaloids? Uh, these are cholesterol derived compounds. Uh, they are unique to tomato, or at least these uh, specific chemical species. Uh, other solanaceous crops like potatoes and peppers, they also make their own versions of these compounds, um, but the ones that I'm showing here specifically uh, can only be found in tomatoes and, and close relatives of tomato. Uh, previously, it was thought that these compounds would degrade during ripening, and so uh, alpha tomatine, which I've circled here, accumulates in green fruits. And uh, during ripening, it was thought that this alpha tomatine gets kind of broken down into uh, its kind of chemical constituents. And then these, these compounds just kind of go away. Uh, but that's been shown to not necessarily be true uh, in the recent, recent literature. Uh, these compounds are also considered to be uh, bitter and an anti-nutrient. Uh, although I wanna point out, there's actually no evidence for toxicity of these compounds in humans. Uh, as a matter of fact, there's actually uh, a couple of land races of these tomatoes that, that uh, accumulate high levels of alpha tomatine uh, in a very specific region of Peru. And the people there have been eating these tomatoes for eons uh, with no ill effect as far as we can tell. And additionally, the uh, bitterness thing is, is still kind of under debate. Um, in that same region of Peru where there are those high alpha tomatine tomatoes, uh, there are also high alpha tomatine tomatoes that are not bitter. Uh, and so that's something that's being uh, investigated currently. One thing I wanted to highlight here as well is I wanted to kind of put these uh, boxes around the pathway uh, because this is going to be kind of a, a recurring theme later on in the talk in terms of early parts of the pathway and late parts of the pathway. So what do these compounds do? Uh, they were first identified back in the uh, basically the 1940s uh, as being uh, chemical agents that can defend tomato plants against biotic stress like fusarium. There have also been some more recent in vitro studies using uh, cell lines of different cancers, uh, and they found uh, that they have potent anti-cancer activity in these in vitro models. These compounds have also been shown to bind to cholesterol and prevent it from being absorbed in the gut. Uh, and additionally, uh, tomatidine, which is the aglycone of this molecule, so just the steroidal alkaloid backbone here, uh, has been shown to reduce muscle atrophy in uh, both in vivo as well as in vitro studies uh, using mice. And so for us, uh, what we're seeing at this point is, okay, we know that these compounds are absorbed from tomatoes. They seem to be a, a major differentiator between uh, those that consume tomatoes and those that don't consume tomatoes. And we know that they have uh, bioactivity to some degree uh, using a number of different uh, levels in terms of uh, you know, antibacterial properties, anti-cancer properties. Uh, so, so we're very interested in these compounds from the standpoint of what are they doing nutritionally? And so there's a number of questions that we have about these compounds. And the first is, how do we extract and quantify these compounds in the first place? The next is, what's the chemical diversity of these compounds? And how does the composition and concentration range uh, change within tomatoes? 
And lastly, the genetic architecture of these traits. And so if we want to test nutritional hypotheses about steroidal alkaloids within tomatoes, uh, we need to answer all three of these questions in order to do that. And so the first one I'm going to talk about is uh, uh, briefly is a method that I created uh, to extract and quantify these compounds in a, a robust and, and uh, sensitive way. And so uh, the issue that I addressed with this, this first project is um, there really, at the time, weren't any validated extraction methods for these compounds. Uh, most people were just kind of using very general uh, methanolic extractions and kind of doing, you know, one sample at a time, um, pretty much just kind of traditional methods um, for polar compounds. The analysis methods that were available uh, tended to lack sensitivity and lack specificity. Um, regarding that later point, uh, more often than not, people would in the past basically just hydrolyze these compounds into the steroidal alkaloid backbone tomatidine and then just measure tomatidine on a, a GC, for example. And so you don't really get that resolution in terms of um, what specific species of alkaloids um, were going into that, that one tomatidine peak that you create after hydrolysis. And so what I did was I utilized uh, a, a piece of equipment in our lab called a genome grinder. And essentially this allowed us to extract many samples at once. Uh, I then developed a high throughput LCMSMS analysis method uh, that allows us to quickly profile uh, tomatoes for these compounds. And from there, we actually had a, a method available um, that we could use to screen populations of tomatoes. So what I'm showing you here is a, a chromatogram from that method and essentially each peak on the chromatogram corresponds to a different steroidal alkaloid. Uh, one thing that I wanted to point out is that we had two peaks in this chromatogram that were uh, for potato derived steroidal alkaloids. And so these are uh, compounds that are chemically similar to the ones in tomatoes, but they are not made by tomatoes. And so they make really good internal standards because they behave and ionize similarly uh, to the ones found in tomato. Uh, and so that's why those are included here. I also wanna point out uh, that we only had authentic standards for a couple of these compounds. And so we had to use high resolution mass spectrometry to tentatively identify the other ones. And so what I'm showing you here is a, uh, this is a spectra uh, produced from fragmenting a standard of alphatomatine. So this is one of the standards that we had available. Uh, and you can see this is the, the parent compound here, and these are all the pieces of it that come apart after uh, colliding it with, with nitrogen. It's argon, rather. Uh, and then what I'm showing you here on the kind of flip side is um, basically that same compound for, from, a, from a sample. Uh, and so essentially what I'm showing you here is that we were able to use these mass spectra as a way to match up uh, the, identity, the identity of these compounds, but also to better understand uh, the chemistry that happens to them within a mass spectrometer so that we can kind of look for some of these fragment compounds in some of our unknown peaks uh, to determine whether or not they are also steroidal alkaloids. All right, so this uh, couple of performance statistics that we had, uh, we had very high extraction efficiency uh, with the method that I developed and also is very sensitive as well. Um, and so I mentioned that, that there weren't really a lot of sensitive methods available. Uh, and so for alpha tomatine, for example, uh, we're looking at femtomoles on columns. So this, we can really, uh, really kind of scrape the bottom of the barrel in terms of sensitivity uh, with this method and, and see these compounds in very, very low concentrations if we have to. I also wanted to briefly show inter and intraday variability. So this is just a measure of um, how well our method performed over time. And one of the last things that I wanted to point out here with this project was um, we didn't want to stop just to tomatoes. We also wanted to sample some tomato products from the store as well. Uh, so I collaborated with a uh, PhD student in Dr. Cooperstone's lab, J.L. Hartman, and he essentially went on a shopping spree and brought back as many different tomato products as, as he could find. And what we ended up finding uh, after profiling all of these is that in total, uh, tomato products tend to have between 0.7 and 3.4 milligrams per serving. Uh, so relative to other phytochemicals, this is actually pretty appreciable in terms of uh, the mass that you're getting um, within a serving size. <clears throat> 
And so again, this kind of warrants, uh, further warrants why we're interested in these compounds because not only are they potentially bioactive in humans, uh, but they're also pretty abundant. Okay, to briefly summarize that, uh, I developed and validated a high throughput extraction and analysis method for steroidal alkaloids. Uh, and these were some of the first reports of steroidal alkaloids found in tomatoes and tomato-based products. Okay, so I mentioned earlier, we kind of had these three big questions about steroidal alkaloids. Um, we've accomplished the first one. We now have an extraction, uh, we now have an extraction method. Uh, and now to answer these remaining two questions, we can apply this method uh, to assess the diversity and the genetic architecture of these traits. So this brings me to the uh, last project that I'm gonna summarize in this talk, uh, which is a uh, essentially a, a looking at a diversity panel of tomatoes that, that tries to represent the genetic diversity present within the red fruited clade. Uh, and this should be coming out anytime now. Uh, we're just getting, just got galley proofs back the other day. So this should be out soon. And so essentially what we were interested in doing was profiling uh, tomatoes to better understand the contributions of both genetics and the environment uh, and how those two factors contribute to diversity uh, of these chemical compounds. And again, this is something that really isn't well understood. And so how did we assemble this diversity panel? So what I did was I looked into the literature and I found that there was a, a previous study that, uh, that assessed the genetic diversity of over a thousand accessions of tomatoes. And what they did in this study that was really critical for me was that they were assessing genetic diversity within all of these different uh, accessions. And what you're seeing here is a, a plot of rarefaction analysis. And so essentially on the x-axis, you're seeing number of individuals within a, a category of tomatoes. And on the y-axis, you're seeing number of alleles per loci. And so this is essentially a, a surrogate for genetic diversity. And what we can do is we can essentially say, what are the minimum population sizes that we need to uh, kind of get the most genetic diversity out of a given subgroup? Uh, and so this analysis helped us determine the uh, population sizes of our tomato subgroups when putting this population, uh, when putting this diversity panel together. Uh, that same study also used uh, a neighbor network approach to better determine how these uh, different groups of tomatoes were related to each other. Uh, and so when I was putting the diversity panel together, I tried to sample from each of these individual subgroups, again, to try to maximize genetic variation. And so what we ended up with uh, is a diversity panel of 107 accessions of tomato. We had 25 accessions of Solanum pimpinella folium, which is a uh, small red fruited ancestor of the modern day tomato. We had 32 accessions of Solanum lycopersicum bar seraciformi, which is our wild uh, cherry tomatoes. Uh, also some of our cultivated as well. And we, we tried to represent both of those groups within this diversity panel. This is an admixture between modern day tomatoes and pimpinella foliums. And then we had 51 accessions of both processing tomatoes and fresh market tomatoes uh, to kind of round out this diversity panel. And this was all grown out in a randomized complete block design. Uh, we had three different environments with two blocks per environment and the total sample size was 642. And I also wanted to show kind of a, a brief map that I made uh, kind of showing the geographic distribution of uh, some of the accessions that were found within this diversity panel. And these are just the, the wild cherry and the Solana and Pimpinella folium accessions. And so to give you guys a little bit more perspective on the um, diversity within our panel, um, I put this slide together showing uh, kind of the range and phenotypes in terms of just visually what we were seeing with some of these different types of tomatoes. So we had uh, teeny tiny tomatoes all the way up to kind of your regular size processing varieties. Uh, and this is a photo of one of the environments uh, in which all of these uh, tomato accessions were grown and replicated. And so one of the first things I wanted to show you here uh, is that steroidal glycolacolide concentrations vary by tomato class. Uh, and so on the x-axis here, I have our, our different groups of tomatoes that went into the diversity panel. And on the y-axis, we have uh, the concentration. And what you can see here is that uh, most of our cultivated varieties 
at relatively lower levels of these compounds, whereas uh, some of our wilds and, and some hybrids that we developed uh, had higher levels of these compounds, which uh, makes sense biologically. We also uh, took some kind of plant breeding approaches to better understand, again, that contribution of genetics versus environment. Uh, and so one of the parameters that I calculated was broad sense heritability. And what I wanted to point out is that for many of these traits, uh, these are actually extremely heritable. And so this, this tells us that the genetics behind the trait uh, are primarily controlling the phenotype that we're seeing. And so again, if we're interested in breeding uh, tomatoes that have different levels of these compounds, uh, knowing that the heritability is high for most of them is, is a good thing because it means that we can uh, control it much better. Okay, and one thing, uh, one more figure that I wanted to show is uh, from using principal components analysis. And again, this is a, a dimensionality reduction technique uh, to better understand the spread and the shape of our data. The first thing I wanted to point out is the blue triangles here. These are all of our cultivated varieties, our, for specifically our cultivated processing varieties. And again, we had over 50 of them and they all clustered together very tightly, uh, which again, kind of lends itself to the idea that maybe there isn't a lot of diversity in these particular compounds uh, within cultivated tomatoes. Some of the wild tomatoes that you can see, which are the uh, red and yellow uh, points, uh, are kind of spread out. They're, they're kind of doing their own thing, indicating that the diversity for these compounds can be found in the wild species. Uh, what's interesting is that we also had this other cluster of uh, specifically of wild cherry tomatoes uh, that were kind of off on their own, uh, clustering separately. And this was kind of curious to us, uh, especially when we uh, put this in perspective of using a loadings plot, which is uh, something that you can derive from your principal components analysis. And essentially, it's a way to uh, describe how different variables that go into your model are contributing to the shape of your data. Uh, and so what you can see here is that we have a handful of compounds on the left uh, that are kind of associated with this uh, shape that we're seeing in our scores plot. Uh, and some compounds over here on the right, again, that are kind of more associated with some of these uh, wild species that are separated on that first principal component. And so one of the things I wanted to bring up here is, is uh, a rendering of uh, what's known about this pathway so far. And I wanted to uh, bring those boxes back because essentially what we were seeing in that previous slide uh, are clusters that essentially are different by their position within the pathway. Uh, and so essentially what you were seeing is that these uh, tomatoes and within our diversity panel were separating either by uh, early pathway intermediates or late pathway intermediates. Another an analysis that I conducted was um, trying to understand the correlation uh, among these compounds each other. And so uh, what you can see here in this figure is that the uh, darker blue, the stronger the correlation coefficient, uh, and the larger the circle, the more significant it was. And you can also see uh, significance indicators within uh, the individual dots. And what you can see with this figure, this is looking at the whole diversity panel. Um, we could see that usually neighboring metabolites were correlated with each other, which from a pathway standpoint makes a lot of sense. Uh, we also saw some weak correlations um, among some of the early and late pathway intermediates, but this was much more pronounced when we looked in wild cherry. And so you can see here, uh, some of these compounds like alpha tomatine and dehydrotomatine are really negatively correlated with some of these late pathway intermediates. And again, in that principal components analysis that I showed, those, uh, there was the kind of that cluster of wild cherry tomatoes that was uh, separate from the rest of the group. And again, we're seeing this uh, negative correlation between early and late parts of the pathway. Uh, and so what we're seeing here is some evidence for differential pathway regulation. And so I wanted to highlight that a little bit more here. And what, I've shown, what I'm showing you here is a couple of box and whisker plots. And so this is the compound, one of the uh, early steroidal alkaloids, alpha tomatine. Uh, you can see in this left cluster here that it's significantly higher. It's actually, you know, the, the average is actually like a few orders of magnitude higher than what you see uh, in the individuals on the right side. And then conversely, if I look at one of the late pathway intermediates, uh, the trend reverses. And so again, that kind of uh, 
supports uh, some of the correlation data that I was just showing, and this idea that this pathway might be differentially regulated. And so we conducted a genome-wide association analysis on this population, uh, and we ended up finding 422 putative associations, which based on uh, linkage groups within tomato, narrowed down to about 45 QTL. And so what we wanted to do was to better understand which QTL might be important for us to focus on and to potentially use for future breeding purposes. Uh, and so what we did was we made a cross uh, between LA2213, which is a uh, one of those land races that I alluded to earlier that has high levels of alpha tomatine and ripe fruits. And we crossed it with uh, OH8243, uh, which is a processing variety. Uh, and then we uh, took those F1, we analyzed them, and then we uh, used a back crossing strategy uh, to understand the distribution of alpha tomatine and the, the genetic architecture of the specific trait. Uh, and I'm showing here that uh, this is uh, from the BC1S1 population. Uh, what we can see here is that we have a number of individuals that still retain that high alpha tomatine trait. Uh, and so this allows us to uh, take mapping approaches so that we can kind of validate some of the QTL that we found in the GWAS analysis. I also have a picture here of uh, my colleague, Sean Festemaker. Uh, having him there because uh, he helped me with this uh, aspect of the project. And I think together we made like, like 700 crosses or something like that. So I wanted to uh, give a shout out to Sean for his help. Okay, one, one thing that I wanted to show you was uh, some of the data from the F1 of that cross that I just mentioned. And so this is uh, LA2213. This is the high alpha tomatine parent. Uh, this is uh, Tainan. This was a separate population that we had developed but uh, didn't move forward. This is a cherry tomato. Uh, and then on this graph here, we have LA2213 crossed with 8243, which is that processing tomato. And what you can see in both of these figures is that the hybrid variety, the, the F1 that was produced as a result, uh, was statistically the same as the low alpha tomatine parent. And so that indicates to us uh, that low alpha tomatine in ripe fruits is a dominant trait. And so we took that, uh, that BC1S1 population, and again, we use that as a, a validation population uh, to narrow down some of the QTL that we were seeing in this population and kind of cross-referencing that with some of the QTL that we found in our GWAS. And what we ended up finding in this validation population was a QTL that was found in both our GWAS as well as our, uh, our segregating validation population. We found a QTL on chromosome three that seems to regulate multiple early pathway intermediates and also contributed to the total amount of steroidal alkaloids in the fruit as well. And so again, I'm showing you this, uh, this pathway schematic. And so what we're hypothesizing is that um, there's either a, a gene or genes within this QTL on chromosome three that's contributing to this uh, transition uh, from alpha tomatine into some of the later pathway intermediates. All right, to, to summarize that study, uh, we determined that steroidal glycoalkaloid profiles are diverse uh, within different groups of the tomato clade. Uh, we also created populations that are high in alpha tomatine that we can use for different breeding goals. Uh, we found that tomato steroidal alkaloids are strongly under genetic control. So again, great for breeding. Uh, we also determined that uh, uh, early and late uh, steroidal glycoalkaloids are differentially regulated. Um, and specifically, we found that chromosome, uh, that QTL on chromosome three, uh, that were validated in segregating in our segregating progeny. Okay, to kind of wrap up here. Um, we talked about how determining uh, we could use a, an animal model to determine how tomato consumption affects tissues where tomato phytochemicals are deposited and, and may have actions. Uh, we developed methods to quantify tomato phytochemicals that previously weren't available. And then we applied those methods to understand how genetic variation affects phytochemical profiles within the fruits. I wanted to thank uh, a number of people that were involved with this project, uh, specifically Dr. Jessica Cooperstone, my PhD advisor, um, all of my lab mates who helped with various aspects of this project. Uh, Dr. David Francis, who was uh, also helping advise me and, and helped us uh, create this diversity panel. 
the greenhouse facility at Ohio State uh, for the uh, back cross population development, uh, the Clinton lab over in uh, the medical school. Uh, this was the oncology lab that uh, helped us conduct our mouse study. The North Central Agriculture Research Station, uh, which is where we grew all our, our tomatoes. The Department of Food Science and Technology for uh, helping us store uh, literally hundreds of bags of tomatoes. Uh, MCIC South, which was the core facility that we used for uh, profiling uh, different samples. Uh, the Ohio Supercomputer Center, and of course, uh, all of the all of the friends that I managed to convince to come out to the uh, farm and help harvest tomatoes with me. Uh, and of course, I'd like to acknowledge our sources of funding, which is the USDA, um, the Ohio State University, and the Discovery Themes uh, Initiative for Foods for Health. And I just wanted to briefly wrap up here. I'm, uh, like I said, I, I just started back in September, so I, I think I'm uh, still within range to make a shameless plug uh, for my upcoming lab. Uh, and so I'm located here at the Children's Nutrition Research Center. Uh, you can see this is our, our greenhouse facility up on the roof. We have about 2,200 square feet of uh, controlled environment uh, growing facilities, uh, which is great for a variety of different research topics, uh, particularly some that I'm interested in. But the way I'm seeing my lab develop is that um, I'm going to continue uh, trying to develop methods for high throughput phytochemical profiling. Um, digging into some of my uh, experiences as a postdoc uh, using in vitro digestion methods to better understand how we um, uptake phytochemicals of interest and borrowing a little bit of uh, techniques from my uh, training as a master's student and an undergrad uh, using controlled environment agriculture uh, to manipulate the phytochemical profiles of uh, fruits and vegetables. And just as a kind of a, a little cartoon schematic of that lab, uh, essentially trying to, to answer this question of how we can leverage uh, genetics and the environment to uh, alter plant biochemistry. Uh, and I mentioned to a couple of people earlier today, I'm also very interested in revitalizing uh, the CNRC's capabilities of using uh, stable isotope labeling to both develop plants for uh, nutritional studies uh, like preclinical and clinical trials, uh, but also to ask uh, basic questions about plant metabolism and biochemistry. And with that, I'm going to leave you guys uh, with my contact information, as well as uh, some photos of, of some of the people that helped make these projects possible. And I would uh, be delighted to take your questions. Thank you so much for the presentation, Dr. Michael. So. Please drop in your questions in the chat box and I'll have, uh, I'll read them out or if you can unmute yourself and ask some questions. If we have too many of them, we can have some of them in the chat box. Thank you. Michael, that was very interesting. I have a quick question for you. I noticed on the slide where you were showing your broad sense heritability that with a couple of the compounds, the heritability was actually very low. Yes. And it was really high. So can you explain where those are in the pathway and what you why you think that might be yeah that's a that's a great point i'm gonna um let me see if i can there we go let me see if i can bring that specific slide up so yeah that's a great point so i actually have this uh i have this table ordered in pathway order um, so a couple of things. So one is that these are both aglycones that appear at the very beginning of the pathway. Um, and probably more importantly, in terms of our ability to measure them, is that despite the sensitive method that I developed to measure these compounds, um, these are extremely low concentrations in ripe fruits. And so I think there's probably um, just variability coming from that, just from the fact that we were kind of near our, our limit of quantification uh, for these compounds. So I think that probably more, more or less affected our ability to accurately measure those, those metabolites. Michael, uh, this is Bimu. Uh, excellent presentation, and I really enjoyed uh, the new uh, ideas on this tomato. Thanks. So, do you do you attribute this uh, variation of wild cherries particularly? Is it because of the dilution effect? You think, or just the levels itself are uh, itself are higher in wild cherries, wild cherry tomatoes? Right. So, yeah, that's a good point. Um, I I don't necessarily attribute it to a, a dilution factor per se. Um, partly because we we also analyze these data and, and normalize basically for for fruit size. Uh, 
Uh, and we still saw that, that diversity pattern essentially. And so I think there, there's just generally um, probably just variation in the, the, the genes that control the enzymes that regulate this pathway um, that may or may not have been selected against during domestication. Uh, again, you know, what I showed in that, in that PCA figure, we can see that all of these, uh, you know, cultivated varieties, they, they all kind of just cluster together. And so we weren't really seeing a lot of variation uh, in some of the, the more domesticated and um, inbred lines that we were working with. Okay, thank you. And another question, quick question is, uh, could you elaborate, do you think we have more evidences on this particular erythrolyte relation with vegetarian in tomato? Sorry, could you repeat that? You mentioned that some of these alkaloids are uh, related to the fusarium control, basically. Right? Are there a lot of evidences or just one or two literature? You know, I, I'm not sure if there's more recent studies. I'd have to look into that. I feel like, it, from what I remember, I feel like those were kind of the initial reports and then it kind of dropped off from there. Um, I think there's some more recent work that's been done, even on like the entomology side, looking at how these um, compounds impact herbivory, but I'm not sure... Yeah, I'm not sure if, if people have kind of picked up the thread on the um, potential of these compounds to affect bacterial or fungal infections uh, in leaf tissue. Okay, thank you. Uh, Dr. Michael, you have a question in the chat box from Dr. Nitin Dalagar. It says, tomatine is present at higher levels in green tomatoes. What are your thoughts with this in relation to your findings? Yeah, so that's that's a great point. So um, let me pull up. There's a great figure that I borrowed here. Yeah. So um, so yeah, the question was related to tomatidine being uh, you know highly present in green tomato fruits, but being very uh, sparse in red <laughs> tomato fruits. Uh, and so I, I think essentially what we're seeing is <clears throat> essentially there's there's this function of ripening that occurs where this pathway is basically getting kind of stopped at the mature green stage. And then once ripening occurs, something is happening in which this pathway can continue. So one possibility uh, in this, this paper came out, I wanna say like maybe less, I think like maybe a year ago this, this fall, um, a, a transporter was found in a similar region to the uh, QTL that we found in chromosome three. And essentially from their study, they uh, found that it was able to transport alpha tomatine out of the vacuole uh, and to be processed by the remaining enzymes that are part of this pathway. And so I wouldn't be surprised if there, there might be something similar like that happening where early on in, uh, you know, when, when the, the tomato fruit is, is unripe, that there's just this backup that's happening. Uh, and then during ripening, there's, there's something that's happening either on the transcriptional level or, or some transporters becoming activated so that the rest of the pathway uh, can be utilized. Thank you. Are there any more questions? Sorry. Hi. Uh, thank you so much for the answer. That was me, uh, Nitin. I have one more question. Is the is these alkaloids, tomatine and alpha tomatine and tomatidine, they are present uh, higher levels on the pulp? Uh, sorry, on the peel or the pulp? Is that that, that, that's a good question. So in my particular study, we didn't uh, separate the kind of tissue subtypes within the fruit. Um, if memory serves, I think they're, the concentration is pretty high in the peel. Um, okay. which kind of, I think it kind of lends itself to kind of that classic, I mean, you, you see this with other compounds as well, like flavonoids, um, where they're basically, you know, sequestered to the, the area of the fruit where they're kind of, you know, needed the most. Um, but yeah, personally, I haven't, I haven't dissected the tomato to see, you know, where, where the concentrations are the highest, but yeah, memory serves, I think it's mostly in the peel, uh, and then a little bit in the pulp. Yeah, it's very really interesting to know because uh, if these levels are high in the peel, uh, then we can relate more onto its antifungal or any antimicrobial activities. So yeah, thank you so much. Yeah, that makes sense. And yeah, I mean, the other thing that, you know, I haven't personally explored, but yeah, I would be curious to know what the diversity of these compounds would be in the green, you know, the leaves. Um, I, I would imagine that, you know, they're the, the 
antifungal or, or antibacterial properties would be even more important since that's, um, you know, most of the tomato's life cycle is just during that vegetative stage. So I imagine that these compounds are, I mean, we know for a fact that these compounds are a lot higher in vegetative tissues, but um, yeah, it'd be interesting to see if there's any relationship between their concentrations and, and disease resistance. Yep. Okay. Any more questions? Okay, so if not, we, we would like to thank Dr. Michael. We're running a few minutes past five o'clock. So thank you so much for your presentation and we hope to meet you soon in person. Yeah, thanks. I really, yeah, I appreciate the, uh, the opportunity to speak. Yeah, it was really nice. Yeah, thank looking you. forward to better, better weather. Yeah. yeah. Thank you, Mike. And again, uh, stay warm. <laughs> thanks, Pimo. You, you too. <laughs> Thank, thank you for joining us and thank everybody else and we'll see you back here in two weeks.